Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship here at St. Martin's United Church. We're very pleased that you chose to worship with us here this morning. My name is Darren Wolf. I'm one of the ministry team here at St. Martin's. And I'm here with my colleague Keith at the back. Oh, yeah, he came early, so I got a nice seat at the back. And uh, my colleague Brian is uh, way uh, spare a thought for him today. He's in Mexico, so he's having to endure those hot temperatures. So, yeah, we'll, we'll say a prayer for him. St. Martin's is an affirming congregation uh, of the United Church of Canada, which means that we offer an intentional welcome to everyone who comes here. And so we hope that uh, if you are a visitor here today or a newcomer, we hope that you do feel welcome. There are people wearing these blue uh, stickers. And so if you do have any questions about our congregation, you can ask anyone who's got a blue sticker on, or you could ask any of us. The sign outside says children welcome and noise expected and so we do expect a little bit of noise and chaos and confusion in the church, um, sometimes caused by our adults as well. So um, we hope that uh, you will be accepting of that as we are. And there's uh, tea and coffee in the area called we call the lounge uh, after the service or if you find a good spot during the service to sneak out for a cup of coffee or a tea. Uh, you can do that as well. We uh, have a tradition here of acknowledging the land upon which we worship, and so I'll say those lines in light type. I would invite you to respond with those words in yellow type. In the spirit of reconciliation, let us acknowledge our relationship with the indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are gathering for worship on the traditional lands of the First Nations and the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people, bound by the understandings made between our ancestors and the original peoples in the agreement known as Treaty 6. We worship with our whole selves, so the activity of our lives and the busyness we do, but also with the quietness of our hearts and appreciating the light of Christ which is in us. join in our invitation to worship. Uh, I'll say those lines in white type. I would invite you to respond with those words in yellow. In our holy book, we read that at the beginning, darkness covered everything. God's creative word called forth light, and a new dawn emerged, bringing order and meaning. Today we read of vast galaxies and an ever-expanding universe. On our tiny planet, we know that darkness and light reflect an age-old dance between plenty and poverty, justice and injustice, power over and power sharing. Might the light of the Holy One shine forth in this hour so that we might be beacons of hope for this planet and its people. And let's continue in prayer together. Source of light, speak your word into our lives today shine in the darkness and illumine our living. When we behold the dark places of our hearts and the dark places of the world, we seek clarity and liberation. Empower us to claim the goodness you have placed in each of us and inspire us to share that goodness so that the entire earth might be touched by your creativity and love. Amen. The reading of this morning is from Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 31. This is part of wisdom's call. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. 
When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. May God bless to our understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Good morning. I'm Debbie Hall. I'm a student at St. Andrew's College, and just this past fall, I took a course on the Holy Spirit. Part of that course was writing a paper on the Holy Spirit, so I chose to study the writings of Roman Catholic feminist theologian Elizabeth Johnson, a nun who's a member of the Sister of St. Joseph's. Johnson says we've forgotten the part, the work of, the, of God known as the Holy Spirit, which performs what is traditionally known as women's work. She explains that in the Bible, the work of the Spirit includes bringing forth and nurturing life, holding all things together, and constantly renewing those things which become broken. This women's work isn't normally noticed, and so it becomes anonymous. Neglect of the spirit and the marginalizing of women seem to go hand in hand. So I chose this reading for today to shine a light on the Holy Spirit's women's work. Our reading today is from Proverbs, which were written from the perspective of a tribal culture as existed in Israel around the 7th century BCE, with households raising their own food. Women cooked, cleaned, spun, wove, and cared for and educated their children. Their partnership with men was based on economics and love wasn't mentioned at all. In fact, it was usually the difficult argumentative wife who was mentioned in Proverbs, such as in 2715. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious wife are alike. You can imagine how annoying that would be. In my research into this passage, I discovered that Proverbs 10 to 30 seem to be an instruct instruction from the clan elders, and scholars think they're from the 10th to 7th century BCE, while chapters 1 to 9 and 31 are from the 5th to 3rd century BCE, written later as an introduction and conclusion to the book. In Proverbs 10 to 30, women are only portrayed in their relationships with men, so their mothers, life partners, widows, and prostitutes. Men in these chapters speak about women, not to them. Often women are the instigators of arguments. And the image of a married woman in 1122 is lovely. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without good sense. Verses 1 to 9 reflect the views of a wealthy society where property and social status were important. Being connected to traditional women's work, the neglect of the spirit has a symbolic connection with the devaluing of women and of nature. So in this tri tribal society of Proverbs, the story is mostly centered on men, with the relationships between men and women being one-sided and broken relationships being the fault of the woman. We seem to have a lot of the same issues going on today, though, if we're honest with ourselves. We may not be as advanced as we could be, given the thousands of years between the writing of Proverbs and now. We don't have slavery in Canada in 2018, but we still have racism, sexism, and poverty. We also aren't doing our best to take care of this beautiful earth built for us by our Creator God. We've got global warming and species extinction. Listening to what's been on the news recently, it seems as if women are still dealing with men treating them in less than an equitable fashion. 
Over the past few years, the military, of which I'm a member, has been in the news for the mistreatment of its female members. So Operation Honour was created to educate military members about the appropriate ways in which men and women should interact with each other. With many news stories recently about powerful men being accused of sexual misconduct, one of my fellow, fellow military members commented that, hey, it's not just the military acting like that. No, unfortunately, it's our entire society which the military reflects. In Canada, we're now finally trying to make up for the way we've treated Indigenous people since we arrived and pushed our way in. We have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. But we can still see the racism that exists if we just look at our own province and the trial of a white man charged with the shooting of an Indigenous man. The racism in our own country is something we don't want to admit to, but can't help but see when it comes to a head as it has during this trial. There's a lot of evidence of the good God's doing in the Bible passage this morning. Chapter 8, where our verses come from today, is the speech of wisdom. Wisdom portrays women's roles in a positive light, with similarities to Near Eastern goddesses. At the end of the reading, we heard wisdom acting playfully towards God. The women who came before wisdom in the stories of the Bible are those women who were considered wise women or counselors, such as Sarah, Rebecca, Michael, and Bathsheba. Wisdom was there beside God at creation, as a mediator between God and humans. She's God's first creature and an expert in both the order of the cosmos and of humans. God brings her into the world and seems to be preparing, preparing a place for her as a parent would prepare a home for their child to live. Wisdom acts like a, a playful child who demonstrates God's closeness and love for humans. She sits together with God, caring for and paying close attention to human beings. She's the Holy Spirit personified and has a clo close connection with women. Yes, wisdom is standing within this patriarchal structure of ancient Israel, but she, important, she points to the importance of women's roles in that culture. Wisdom, or the Holy Spirit, is God turning towards humans. God isn't just masculine, but gains a feminine side through wisdom. Wisdom is related to the act of creation, and so to mothering. She existed before the beginning of the world as the first of God's works. This reading shows us another dimension with the idea that creation is not simply the act of a lone male God. The Holy Spirit both participated in creation and was God's midwife. We can easily picture wisdom as a midwife who helped bring the world to birth. She also slips into the role of mother of all life. Johnson explains that the Holy Spirit is the same divine presence spoken about in the Jewish rabbinic tradition of Shekinah, which comes from the Hebrew word shekan, meaning to dwell or God's dwelling among the people. Shekinah is envisioned in the Bible as symbols of cloud, fire, or radiant light. Johnson also writes that the word for wisdom in Hebrew, hakmah, is grammatically feminine, so we can imagine images, female images of a sister, mother, beloved, chef, hostess, preacher, teacher, and justice bringer. So it makes sense to describe the Holy Spirit using fem female images, given wisdom's female symbolization. Just a bit further, Proverbs 8.35 reads, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor, favor from the Lord and associates the gift of life with wisdom. The Holy Spirit is God's grace in our world today. She's God's own loving self present and active in the world. So within the Trinity, the Spirit is God present and active in the world. Johnson teaches that the Holy Spirit creates a pull within human beings to respect the world and all its living creatures, including ourselves. 
when we feel sadness about Earth's destruction through our own doing, or the extinction of a species, or when we look at the beauty in nature, whether it's the awesome power of a storm, or our dog curled up at our side, or any other phenomena of this planet and its skies, we've potentially brushed up against an experience of the creative power of the Holy Spirit. So through the Spirit, we're able to see the divine in nature. Spirit helps us care for, change our own lives or care for the sick or homeless. We especially feel Spirit in connections we have with others, in the give and take of loving relationships, in the joy and pain of bearing, birthing, and rearing, in everyday work, in befriending the stranger and caring for the truly helpless. This is also true about loving ourselves, as when we appreciate our wondrousness as a creature, forgive ourselves the way God forgives, we're having an encounter with the Spirit. God gives us the gift of self-love through the Spirit. This type of self-love is the Spirit that enables us to give the gift of love to others. In this way, Spirit sets people on the right path. Spirit's mothering presence is linked with the power to speak out when we see something in society that's wrong, give comfort to those who are suffering, and bring justice to the poor. We feel the healing power of spirit in the impulse and work to end oppressions such as racism and sexism. Spirit is God everywhere. We can envision spirit as a mother rocking in her chair, a baby in her arms, her knitting in her lap. The Holy Spirit, or God, may not be as obvious as we might want, but I love the way Johnson describes spirits using metaphor. She says, if God is pictured as the glowing sun, Jesus as a ray of that same light shining, streaming down to earth, then spirit is the point of light that actually arrives and affects the earth with warmth and energy. So spirit is the suntan the spot of warmth and light where the sun arrives and actually has an effect. She also compares God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to a spring, river, and irrigation channel, and to a plant with root, shoot, and fruit. Spirit is God in each moment. When people talk about God doing, in the, doing things in the world, they're usually talking about the Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts in our lives to make us receptive to what God wants us to do. So let's ask ourselves, what can we do this week to help Spirit? So now go from this place, surrounded with the cloak of wisdom, listening for the niggles of the Holy Spirit to enact God's love in the world. Amen.